Hello, everybody. This is John with Forward Talk, and we have a uh, very special guest with us today, Pastor Chad Townsley. And uh, we are uh, very thankful to have him with us. He has been my pastor for a number of years whenever I was uh, evangelizing before I came to Point of Mercy to, to pastor. I was basing out of the church there in O'Fallon, and what a tremendous gift of grace he and the congregation there were uh, to me and my ministry and life. And so we're happy to have him with us uh, today for this episode. And uh, as I was telling him right before we started recording, I only have like 11% battery on my uh, on my laptop. And I forgot to bring my charge cord with me to the church. So this might be a part one, part two type scenario. But we're going to go as far as uh, the battery will allow us to go today. But welcome to Forward Talk, Pastor Townsley. And it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me, for sure. So we are we're going to talk today about uh, the idea of fellowship and what that what that looks like, and talk a little bit about the uh, the, the general concept of of fellowship in the in the New Testament. Does it does the term or the idea of fellowship look like kind of the the modern view of fellowship that we have where we have uh, interstate fellowship where somebody from the East Coast fellowships someone from the West Coast type right. of scenario. And um, is is that what the Bible means when he talks about fellowship? Is that what the New Testament had in mind when it speaks about the idea of, of fellowship and believers fellowshipping with one another? Or was it more of a local church fellowship was it um, a regional type fellowship uh, in other words the churches in rome or the churches in galatia as paul writes a single letter to those churches um, what do you what do you think fellowship looked like in in the new testament well obviously there were a lot of different uh, logistical issues then than there are now for us today. Um, I, I'll just go ahead and venture out to say that I think we've had a bit of a skewed perspective of fellowship and uh, perhaps have done it better from church to church or state to state, like you've uh, described, uh, better than we've done it in-house yeah. within our local assemblies. And I think in the New Testament, by virtue of the logistics and geography, that there was uh, not the absence of a focus on other churches, because Paul would reference other churches when writing to a specific church. But I yeah, think like there's Corinthians a, to the Church of God, which is at Corinth, and to all that in every place. Right. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> right. But I think there was a, a, a stronger emphasis and focus on on the local church. And I think we would do well to make sure that we're putting priority and emphasis on the local church. So as we're looking at, say, for instance, 1 Corinthians, as Paul is dealing in chapters 8 through 10 with issues of charity and how to handle uh, our brothers who may uh, function different in relationship to meats or Sabbath or many other issues that existed in the church at Corinth. What Paul was dealing with was how congregations interact uh, with themselves, how they deal with their own in-house issue. It, it wasn't a situation where I'm going to disfellowship that church because they don't agree with me on what types of meats to eat or, or whether or not uh, they do sabbath or what other whatever other uh intramural issues that that paul discussed in first corinthians and even in in romans uh even in the book of romans romans chapter 12 i believe it is and uh i think <clears throat> i think we have seriously missed the boat on how we view interest uh, interstate fellowship to where yeah. we Im impose <clears throat> like our own local set of of traditions or customs to the point to where we disfellowship someone yeah. in another state or 
or even, you know, someone a couple hours from us in our own state, we disfellowship them because they don't hold a particular tradition that we hold. Right. Yeah, I think there's a, a major divide there on on our expectation of what others should do or maybe how we should how we should treat them. Uh, for me, that's that's evolved over the years for me and 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 my journey. What has been a uh, such a, a critical hinge for me is in Ephesians, Paul says in chapter four, uh, Paul says to the church in verse three that we need to be eager to and be diligent to maintain or to work to keep the unity of the spirit. And then he goes a few verses later in verse 13, after he talks about the gifts to the church, the ministries, he said, until we all come to the unity of the faith. And uh, I like the, 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 the order that Paul puts that in, because I think, we, I think we flip it around and we have this expectation that there cannot be unity of the spirit until, until there's we have, unity of the faith. Right, until there's unity of the faith. We feel like we have to believe the same, practice it the same, uh, in order for there to be this, this unity when Paul says, work to keep the unity of the Spirit. Until. Until we all come to the unity of the faith. And Jesus said in John 14, when he declared, I am the way, the truth, the life, uh, he said, you know, this, this Spirit of truth is with you, but shall be in you. And in verse or chapter 16, verse 13, he says there in John, Jesus says that the spirit of truth will lead and guide you into all truth. And so I think, I think that's where Paul was saying, you know, let's work to keep the unity of the spirit, the spirit of truth that leads and guides. Yes. Because, because if we're all growing and maturing to some extent, we're all moving. We're yeah. all shifting towards Christ. Uh, I mean, he, he's our goal. I'm not. You're not. Yeah. My church, their church, your church is not our ultimate aim. It's Christ. And so right. if we... To the fullness of the measure, the stature of the fellowship. Uh, yes. Of, of the of fullness Christ. of the measure, the stature of the manual. <laughs> right. Right. And so I think if we maintain the unity of the spirit, that... Uh, it, and that gets tricky because it... it is seemingly easier when we have, you know, a checklist. We have some guidelines yeah. that we can say, well, hey, that church measures up to ABC. For us, that church doesn't. And so it's an easy choice who will fellowship when I don't think it's that easy. I think we have to trust the leading of the Spirit and uh, in a very Christ-honoring way, acknowledge that He's at work in all of us. And uh, to whatever extent it makes us comfortable or uncomfortable, I think, um, I, I think our net could broaden a bit in terms of that fellowship. I mean, especially over <clears throat> some of the issues that we do it, that we yeah. have this fellowship for. Oh, yes. The, the hills we die on and the hills we crucify others on that are extra biblical. Speaking of the way you made that distinction, it was, I'm not... I don't remember who did it first, but who said it first, but I think it was a friend of ours. They, they asked him, is this really the hill you want to die on? And he responded back with, is this really the hill you want to crucify me on? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and it's a great way to flip the question around because we, we have this, again, this expectation of others um, that, when we run it through the, the lens and the filter of scripture, uh, it, it, it'll probably surprise us who, who we are to fellowship. Um, oh, that's uh, absolutely true. And that has to be the criteria. I'm, I just started this week at church history class and the first week is all about the reformation and, and, and Martin Luther, of course, at the, fountainhead of that that reformation yeah and um the fact that luther initially he did not he was not trying to leave the catholic church he was not intending to to do what he ended up where things ended up going he wanted to stay in the catholic church he wanted to cause reform within within right within the movement and re retain many very Catholic 
type traditions throughout most of his life, even though he was declared a heretic by the church and excommunicated and, and kicked out. And it was over a very central issue for him, which, it, you know, at the heart of it was the idea that the just shall live by faith, um, that yes. justification comes by faith alone, that the authority in the believer's life is scripture alone. And um, so for him, at the heart of it was the gospel, that what what really sent him over the edge was the selling of indulgences, that somehow you could sell trinkets to people to get their loved ones out of out of right. purgatory. Purchase, purchase and the saying yeah. and the saying that the that tipped him over the edge from one of the peddlers of indulgences was as soon as something about as soon as uh, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings another soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and that's how indulgences were being yeah. were being sold and they were raising money to build um i think it was uh saint peter's and so uh church and so this was at the heart of what luther decided that it decided that he was going to make a stand on by nailing the the 95 thesis to the door of the wittenberg church and and even then he wasn't trying to disfellowship at least initially the catholic church sure. he was willing to work within the system to yeah. to to cause reform and obviously the rest is history the catholic church didn't stand for it but even with an issue as central as the 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 gospel being on the line to be able to you know to sell trinkets to people to sure. get their loved ones out of purgatory yeah. Luther was still willing to make concessions. Stay, yeah, stay within the fellowship of of the church and the things that we. The point is, is the things that we often disfellowship over. You know, they wear wristwatches or they celebrate this holiday or that holiday or, yeah, or the color hose that they let the women wear. Or, you know, just any list of s stupid things that we have fellowshiped or disfellowshiped people for over the years, I think is just such a tragedy to the spirit of the New Testament and the gospel about what it is that unites us. Yeah. I, a uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Daniel made a statement a uh, number of years ago. I heard him in a message. Couldn't tell you the rest of the message, but this one statement. <laughs> and uh, rest of the message wasn't worth hearing anyway. So. <laughs> but he said, we need to be united by the who, not divided by the what's. Yes. And when we keep Christ at the center, it doesn't mean that your what's or my what's are irrelevant or don't matter because there's value and importance there, but we can't let them be those hills that I die on or choose to crucify uh, you on. Mark Driscoll explains it like this, and I think it's a great analogy. He says it's, it's the closed hand, the open hand. Yeah. And uh, so in, in the closed hand, we hold these are these are the non-negotiables this is what's absolute settled in scripture clear and clarified the open hand are 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 the negotiables uh those are the areas that maybe scripture is at best vague maybe scripture doesn't even say anything about it but it's a, it's a faith tradition that if it's not weighing down the gospel it, it may be a harmless tradition and and we need discernment to know what's in the closed hand, what's in the open hand, and to be charitable, uh, charitable towards that. Uh, John Piper, I was reading uh, here a while back, and John Piper made this statement, and he said regarding his particular movement, he was addressing some issues within, but I think it's applicable for uh, all of us. He said that the deeper and stronger you want your fellowship to be, the more theology must be shared. And yeah. I, I think there's a truth in that. Um, and so I don't think that dismisses Ephesians 4 that I've referenced. I think that we need to maintain the unity of the spirit. Uh, even when there's a myriad of differences, I, I think as long as there is fruit and the presence of the Holy Spirit, let's, let's maintain that unity. But I do think that 
relationships and fellowship maybe can deepen and be stronger and uh, richer as there's more shared. Yeah, obviously uh, the people, the, the, the people, the, the ministries, the churches with whom I more closely align theologically is obviously naturally going to be the stronger relationship, the stronger, you know, connection, the stronger, right. the, the stronger fellowship. But what that doesn't mean is that outside of those close networks that um, we can't fellowship with other Christians who uh, differ from us even significantly for local community mission and things of that nature. Okay. Maybe take them. Yeah. Maybe take a moment to talk about that because <laughs> you've done, you and your church have done some great things in your community by connecting with, you know, uh, other Christians within your, within your, um, area. Sure. Uh, first I'll speak to the, just the term you're using Christian. And I think, I think we, who have, you know, my, my background and perspective comes from a uh, Pentecostal apostolic uh, tradition and, and belief system. And so we tend to, to really like hang everything on those terms and we're uncomfortable using the term Christian. Uh, I think you may have wrote a good book that has stuff to say about this. Uh, but I think we need to be more comfortable self-identifying as a Christian. There's, yeah. there's no harm in that. We don't, we don't have to further clarify that we're part of a uh, more, more elite version. Yeah. Uh, there's we're, special forces of Christianity. Yes. <laughs> I like uh, that. So, um, I, I we're the think, green berets of uh, Christianity. Right, right. Yeah, that's if green is permissible and wearing hats. <laughs> the, so, um, I think if we're, if we're okay and need to be okay with the term Christian, that, that's the core foundation. And then, yes, we believe in the apostles' doctrine, hence apostolic. We believe in the experience of the, of the baptism Spirit. of the Holy Spirit. There's Pentecost. Um, but I, I, think, I think to try to classify those as separate things or, or something uh, better than um, uh, I, I don't think we need to be uncomfortable identifying as a Christian. I don't, I don't right. think. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. I, I think we need to, to bring its clarity back and not, not yeah. just accept it as being too vague, but what does that mean for the community? Yeah. We, we've gotten like super involved. Um, it's part of the culture and DNA of our church. Uh, uh, we have three core values. One of those is serve. And we, that like we get all in with the community. Um, Want to be the hands and feet of Jesus um, a lot of it is a no strings attached approach. I mean, we invest a whole lot in the local missions, but we've done a lot of combined efforts and outreach events. And by outreach, I mean, doing good. Um, I mean, reading the poor. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we've done events from just uh, your, your local food pantry things to uh, a massive event with an organization called Convoy of Hope. Uh, out of Springfield, Missouri, where, I mean, we've had thousands, we've done a couple different events now where we've probably had, I don't know, seven, 8,000 total come through in, in a day's time where, you know, where we're providing, uh, you know, cancer screenings, dental checks, uh, free haircuts, giving away groceries, providing a hot meal, um, setting them up with career opportunities, job interviews, just trying to uh, do good in our community. And then of course there, there's prayer involved and, and, and connections involved, but those events have taken, you know, loads, hundreds of volunteers. And it so happens the, 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 the two large events we've done, the coordinator of that, um, uh, I don't recall volunteer. I volunteered to be on the lead team. Uh, I think I got voluntold to do the, the capacity. Yeah. That, that's when you're a volunteer, but you just get told what you're going to do. And so, uh, but I served in a capacity of church relations and, uh, the, the first event I did, uh, with this organization was in 2015 and I had already been stretched in some of my thinking and, uh, just my, my thought processes regarding fellowship and involvement. Um, I kind of grew up in a context where we just did, we didn't do much of anything with other groups 
uh, all of our focus, our partnerships, we're all with people of. Yeah, um, we're very close within a small margin of exactly where we within are. Within a small, small margin, if not identical, you know, it, it was pretty close. Um, and so uh, these events really stretched me and in some ways made me a little uncomfortable. Uh, but I learned a lot about myself, uh, learned a lot about uh, just the, the power of what we can unite around. And we had a very eclectic uh, group, um, we, but we had parameters as well because this was a faith-based organization, gospel-centered, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, people whose, you know, their core focus in faith was on and is on Jesus Christ. Um, and so for me, uh, that became like for, for partnering on this community outreach events, uh, for me, that's, that's the connecting point. We may, uh, describe it differently, define it differently, uh, even from a doctrinal standpoint, believe some of those fundamentals differently. But if we're endeavoring to point to Jesus and I'm yeah. taking a risk at saying this, but if we're endeavoring to point to Jesus and not ourselves, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to partner with that. This wasn't some big doctrinal symposium. It wasn't. Or it wasn't them inviting them to teach Wednesday night Bible class at your church or right. preach, uh, you know, uh, uh, even a Sunday service. This was just a coming together for a, a community service. Sure. It's saying, what can and we do? And by service, I mean serving the community. Right. Service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that regard. Um, and so we have, as a church, we've been immensely blessed to be able to partner with events like that. And uh, as I've led our congregation into those partnerships, uh, I mean, we've been blessed because we've been a blessing. God has opened up doors for other conversations, has provided uh, relationships for me. Uh, th through this has has elevated us, given us you know a platform. Though that's not what I'm seeking or looking for. There just have been those opportunities as we unite together around um, around what we can. And again, to clarify for those who you know may be a little nervous, it's not uh, you know sharing a, a pulpit. Um, Though, though we do have a community, a community family. service that you, yeah, get, that, we even that have, yeah. So even outside, I think I attended of, one of those that where you spoke. Okay, sure. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> what that looks like is outside of just doing good and, and doing, you know, feeding the poor, help, you know, helping those in need. Um, we have a community Thanksgiving service for those yeah, who are comfortable right. participating. Um, you know, there's worship. Uh, there's a rotation. Usually whoever hosts it the one year, the following year, they will speak at it. Um, and so, you know, it brings a couple few hundred people together in our community. It's not our, one of our largest events, but it is something where we come together. We can worship Once a Jesus. year for a Thanksgiving service. Right. And we, you know, we, we, there's a message that is brought, um, you know, Overall, during the spirit of Thanksgiving, it's all pretty, you know, palatable and a workable thing. There may be some nuances of, of the service or depending on who's hosting it, they're at liberty to uh, do things their way. So there's been times we've been in a more of a liturgical format. Yeah. Um, and, and we just roll with that. And I'm sure it's interesting. That. And yeah, I, I learned I learned more about maybe how they do it. Um, you know, some folks may really draw a line there and have an issue um, with that, but, uh, are still trying to reconcile in their mind why they felt the presence of the Lord at a Gaither concert. Exactly. And so, um, and I, don't so, think I don't think that's ever happened for me. It has it never yet. Southern gospel doesn't do it for you. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so we, we've done this, we do the same, a uh, very similar, not near about to the level you guys do, but every Thanksgiving we, we connect with a local uh, I think it's a Presbyterian church downtown. We serve uh, serve dinners to uh, to the poor in our community and and things of that nature. So, not nearly to the level and consistency that you guys do, but we we definitely are involved in, in our community in a very very similar way with with other church groups within within our local community. 
And so um, we are down to 4% on our battery. So let's pause this here and uh, we will, we will pick up with another episode of continuing to talk about uh, fellowship and what that looks like in on several different levels. But thank you so much for taking the time. And I, and I apologize that I forgot my cord at home and, and, and my battery was so low on my computer, but we will do this again, maybe plan to do it. uh, I don't know if you have nine o'clock available next week or eight o'clock your time available next week, but if you can, we'll pick it up next week. No, we'll definitely, definitely make it happen. No, no apologies necessary. Um, Well, man, I I sure do love and appreciate you. And thank you so much for taking the opportunity uh, to talk with me this morning. And don't run quite yet after I stop the recording. I want to say just a couple things to you. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to next week, as long as you don't disfellowship me between now and then. (laughs) Well, you better stay in line is all I can say. Right.